Hello, Prof. Joe here. This video will be about relative motion acceleration, and we're going to pick up where we left off on the relative motion velocity video. If you haven't watched that one yet, I recommend watching that one first. In that video, we took this ruler, and we had it going through general planar motion, where it's rotating and translating, and we were able to mathematically separate out its translation from its rotation. If you recall, we made We made this drawing. We had the ruler, and it went from one position to another, and we drew an imaginary ruler in the middle where we imagined that it first translated and then rotated. And we were able to separate those out. We came up with the equation that the velocity of one point, we'll call it b, is going to be equal to the velocity of another point plus the velocity of b with respect to a. And we recognized that that was the same equation we got in relative motion uh, when we did it with our particle assumption. Now what we're going to do, well, we then realized that the second part, the relative velocity of b with respect to a, was due to pure rotation inside the coordinate axis system that's traveling at a, the relative coordinate axis system that's translating along with a. And because of that, we could replace the relative velocity of b with respect to a with our pure rotation equation omega a b crossed with the position of b with respect to a. Okay, keeping those in mind, we're going to go ahead and take the derivative of our first equation. We're going to take the derivative of the velocity of b equation. Take the derivative of the first term, we get the acceleration of b. And that's going to be equal to the acceleration of a plus the relative acceleration of b with respect to a. Nothing too surprising there. But we want to dig in a little bit more and see if we can figure out that term, the acceleration of b with respect to a. To dig into that, we can just take the derivative of the second equation. I'm just going to give myself a little more room here. The derivative of the velocity of b with respect to a, dt, it's going to be equal to, well, we're taking the derivative of a product, so we need to use the product rule. Product rule is going to be the derivative of the first one, which will be alpha AB, crossed with the position of B with respect to A, plus the first one, which is our omega AB, crossed with the derivative of the second one, which would be the velocity of B with respect to A. Okay. Now we can do one more substitution where we take our first equation, or I'm sorry, our second equation here, which gives us the velocity of b with respect to a in our translating coordinate system and plug it in for the velocity of b with respect to a. We're also going to plug in this full equation for that term. We end up with the acceleration of b equals the acceleration of a plus, now we're going to plug in this equation here for our, accelerate, our relative acceleration term, alpha AB crossed with the position of B with respect to A plus omega AB crossed with one last substitution. Our velocity of B with respect to A is equal to omega cross R. Omega AB crossed with the position of B with respect to A. Okay, there's our acceleration equation, our relative motion acceleration equation. And you know what? We've seen this before. We've seen this exact same equation when we derived this for par with our particle assumption. The difference here is that we're using it with rigid body general planar motion. And what it's telling us is that we can find the acceleration of any point on that body if we know the acceleration of another point and if we know how the angular the angular velocity is changing. This is just geometry, so we can generally get that from the picture in the problem. If we know the angular, the current angular velocity, and again, that's just geometry. This is a very useful equation that we can apply to um, in many different situations. Another thing we can notice is that uh, in our translating coordinate system, we have pure rotation. With pure rotation, we expect to have a tangential and a normal component of acceleration. Let's see if we can spot those. 
If we look at this first term, alpha cross r, this would be our tangential component to acceleration in that local coordinate system. And we have our omega cross omega cross r, which would be our normal component. Now you might be saying, I remember our normal component being v squared over r. What's this new omega cross omega cross r? Well, they actually end up being the same thing. If you recall, our omega cross omega cross r had a shortcut in 2D. The 2D shortcut was minus omega squared, where that's not a vector, but r is. OK, if we think uh, back to normal tangential coordinates, and we think of a body going around in a circle, we had our rho, which was the radius of that circle. And we said that the normal acceleration was v squared over rho. Well, if we're in circular motion, as we're showing here, our rho would be an r. And we also know that v is equal to omega r. Okay? So if we plug both of those in, v squared over rho would be equal to omega squared r squared over r. Okay, omega squared r squared over r, one of the r's cancel, and we get omega squared r, which is what our normal acceleration is showing here. Of course, the negative sign is because of direction, which we would not get out of the scalar equations. We get that out of the picture. So hopefully, that gives you not only the equation that we can use, but some insight into the equation. Okay, so let's look at the equations we have derived so far. We have our relative velocity equation, which we derived in a previous video. We use that to derive our 2D and 3D relative acceleration. And we know that there's a shortcut for 2D only where we can replace the omega cross omega cross r with this negative omega squared. Um, you're going to be using these to solve problems. And if you notice, all three of these equations are relating the motion of one point to the motion of another. The points that you choose can be critical for how easy or hard it is to solve the problem. We already talked about one shortcut for this, using the instantaneous center of zero velocity. If you can find that instantaneous center, obviously your velocity is zero at that point. There is no instantaneous center of zero acceleration. And the instantaneous center of zero velocity does not have zero acceleration, because that center is always changing. Um, so it can be important what type of which point you choose to be your reference point. Um, I wanted to go through an example of a rolling disk and show you what you might consider in that example. So if we have a rolling disk and it's going along the ground, there are really two points that we know quite a bit about. The first one is that instantaneous center of zero velocity we already talked about in a previous video. We know the velocity is zero because the ground's not moving and therefore if the disk is not slipping, that point on the disk is also not moving. The other point to consider is the center. To figure out what we know about the center, I'm going to call that G to match what the textbook uses. And down here, I'm going to call this one A. So if we look at the, the velocity first, we could use our velocity equation and say the velocity of G is equal to the velocity of A um, plus omega crossed with the position of g with respect to a. Uh, because we know a is the instantaneous center, we can cross that out and say that's 0. It's the instantaneous center of 0 velocity. It's not moving. OK, and then if we plug in what we know about omega and r, in this case, r would be the position of g with respect to a, which would be the radius pointing upward. And we'll just say that has a magnitude of r so we can keep it general. So the velocity of that center point would be equal to omega k. Um, and the omega would depend on which way it's rolling. I'm going to say this one is rolling to the right. And that would generally be a negative omega based on the right-hand rule. So negative omega k. And we're going to cross that with our r uh, j. Uh, with our shortcut, 
if we are crossing a k with a j, we expect to get a negative i. And there's a neg another negative there. So we would expect to get that the velocity of that center of mass is equal to omega r i. Now, you probably could have guessed that, because we've done some, um, uh, some other problems where we use arc length to figure out uh, the velocity. But this is a very important point. If a disk is rolling without slipping, we know the velocity of the center. Obviously, the velocity of that center point is just going to be a straight line. And the magnitude of that velocity is going to be omega r. What happens when we take the derivative of that equation? We take the derivative of that equation, we get the acceleration of that center is going to be d omega dt times r. r is not changing because that's the radius of the disk. And you can see that it's also linear, right? That point is accelerating along a straight line. It's going to be a very useful point when solving problems. Uh, this is equal to alpha r times i. And of course, the scalar versions would just be v equals omega r and a equals alpha r. So that can be a good start to your problem is to consider the center point if you have a rolling disk. Hopefully that's helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.